Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox here again. Uh, we're coming to the next unit of the X Informatics course, describing the basic principles of parallel computing. These have actually remained uh, essentially identical over the last, well, back sort of probably from the beginning of time, but they've been well understood for the, at least the last 30 years. And when we come to the parallel computing and map produce and things like that used in um, Big data, the principles are the same as those the principles that have been used for this substantial period of time. So the purpose of this unit is to explain how to cope with the word big in the big data ecosystem. And that big is coped with by doing parallel computing on these clouds that we're using to run the data analytics. And that requires that we write a parallel algorithm for the analytics, which does the processing of the big data. Here's our usual collage of X informatics fields, which we're trying to enable through these general techniques. Now let's discuss the key idea that underlies all data processing done in parallel. So, we have our applications. They're running on our cloud, which um, maybe even has a million servers. But certainly, there's several with 100,000 servers. And those, that means maybe a million or so cores. Each of those cores is uh, independent. And so that's actually pretty convenient when the cloud wants to process your, your smartphone or your tablet, because he can take just one of those million cores, assign that core to you, and it will handle um, communication with you. So that means that a million core cloud can easily handle a million requests at the same time. And this is the simplest form of parallel computing, so-called pleasingly parallel parallel computing, where we have, in this case, parallelism over users. Every user is done in parallel. And but in this particular way I explained it, they are, each user only gets one core. But that's not sufficient in general, because a given user might want to do a web search. Doing a web search with one core is probably not efficient. You, you, would, um, you want to access the whole um, internet, so you would do a parallel search. And that would require several cores to be temporarily, not, not continuously. Remember, we need uh, the search needs to respond in about a tenth of a second. So for that tenth of a second, you might get lots of cores assigned to an, any one user. If you want to do a large clustering to build the regions to do your uh, recommender systems with, that large clustering would need to do, you have several cores to be able to complete it. In a, in a relatively small time. So all these uh, applications use called so-called data parallelism. If you like the previous, the thing we discussed at the top of the slide was user parallelism. And uh, in data parallelism, we take actually the big data and chop that big data up into parts. And that's the same for, way that supercomputers calculate complex models of the universe. universe. They calculate uh, nuclear fusion, they design a new battery, they see what happens when a car crashes, or they evolve a bunch of molecules in a, to study protein dynamics. So this is the essential idea, which you mentioned uh, on the last slide. We divide the cores into groups, and each user has a group of those um, cores. This is fiscally possible because, as I mentioned, the user does not need these cores for long periods of time. So they might even have one core permanently assigned to a user, although that, even that's not really necessary to act as the uh, linkage to the um, to the user. In fact, that single core would probably handle several users just linking to them. But every now and then, you might assign a thousand cores to one user, and that's fine as long as you only do it from, for a fraction of the time. So the, the, this all started with largely with scientific computing. That, that was where parallel computing first started. 
where we did things like uh, weather forecasting, or we did, uh, which was the study of uh, air and moisture and things like that, or the, the related problem of airflow over a plane. And then you divide the air into a mesh, and you determine the pressure, the density, and the velocity at each mesh point. That's a very basic approach to solving differential equations, where the data is now the mesh points. It's not the rankings of a recommender system or the uh, set of, uh, of internet uh, um, data points, internet data, data fragments. It's a bunch of mesh points. And I say, those mesh points are characterized by things like pressure, density, velocity. Whereas in the um, commerce applications, it would be characterized by each. The data would be people, or the data would be items. And the things associated with the items would not be the pressure, it would be the rankings. Or it could be the color, the properties of the item. But in every case, we have a set of data points, those data points have uh, properties, and then what we we will look at each data point um, in groups. We will divide those into into groups and assign one core to process each group. We would typically always take all the properties of a given data point, namely all the rankings or all the content-based uh, properties, and assign them to that core. So what we're decomposing is not the properties, but the actual data. Same for web pages. Every a core that is working on a particular web page has all the crawl data for that web page. That's after all the stemming and other pre-processing that's necessary. And for k-means, uh, the things we uh, t take to to chop up are the points. And so we take uh, groups of points and we store the parameters of those points, which are just the coordinates and whatever space they're defined. Um, in the um, core that's uh, associated with processing those points. So this summarizes the basic approach of uh, big data and parallelism. Um, so we split the big data into parts. We put each part in a separate computer core. Uh, those parts can be stored on disk, which is sort of typical for document processing applications, which tend to have a lot of data. Or they can be stored in memory, as is in the case of scientific simulations. Obviously, as memory access is faster than disk access, you try to store things in memory. And even if you store them in disk, you use so-called caches to put uh, the data you really want at a given moment in memory for quick access. So we will, uh, we will now go through some examples of this, um, and we will start with the sort of very basic um, sort of first example that was done a long time ago, and but illustrates the basic principles. And so this is a two-dimensional scientific simulation. It happens to be so-called Laplace's equation. And a key feature of all those scientific simulations, as they involve derivatives, if you want to calculate the derivative at a point, all you need is the value of the thing you're calculating the derivative of at neighboring points, so all the operations are so-called local. If you want to look at one point, you can do that just knowing information about the neighboring points. 